Hitori Yoshi is a lonely boy who suddenly receives an unexpected visit from a maid at his house. With a cute demeanor and a unique request to be hired, she reveals herself as a clumsy ex-hit woman. Living his normal student life, one day, Hintoyoshi Yokoya receives a visit from a maid who claims to be an assassin looking to be hired. As she walks toward the Yokoya residence, the woman's tyra jingles with every step, making noise wherever she goes. Meanwhile, the boy in his terribly messy room sleeps like a rock. When the doorbell rings, Hintoyoshi sluggishly drags himself downstairs and checks the entry camera to see who's at the door. Outside, a beautiful woman apologizes for the intrusion but expresses her desire to be hired as the house is made. He invites her in immediately, apologizing for the mess, and explains that his parents are away. As he grabs something to drink from the kitchen, he starts to realize that he let a complete stranger into his home without thinking, so he tries to stay polite while eyeing her suspiciously. In his mind, she might be trying to sell something or propose something illegal, so his best bet is to stall until he can figure out how to send her away. He asks if she's worked as a maid before, to which she replies that she has, but her previous jobs were a bit different. They involved executing traitors who had betrayed her former employer. In fact, she's here because of a recommendation from that very employer. Itoyoshi thinks the woman must be joking, but part of him is sure she isn't, and fear starts to creep over him. At this point, getting the stranger out of the house isn't just a matter of politeness, it's a necessity. He then asks if she has any connection to his family, since she came on recommendation. The maid explains that Hitoyoshi is the grandson of the woman who once lived in the house of the second son of the cousin of the wife of the heir to her employer. Instinctively, Hitoyoshi blurts out that he's practically a stranger to this employer but quickly tries to correct his posture so as not to offend her. Trying to shift the conversation, he asks what kind of executions she specializes in. To demonstrate, she takes the young man outside and uses a tree as a target, throwing sharp metal projectiles at the trunk. Realizing she's not messing around, he makes it clear that he doesn't want her to kill anyone and that he doesn't even know this employer she mentioned, so he won't be hiring her. She understands, apologizes for taking up his time, and leaves without causing further trouble. Hintoyoshi wonders if it was all just a dream, but soon notices something left behind in the grass. Meanwhile, on the other side of the story, the maid had already guessed the outcome would be no different, but her biggest problem now is figuring out where to go next. As she waits for the subway, she continues on her way, but soon Hintoyoshi appears, running the background, holding a bell in his hand, it's the bell from her tiara that had been left behind at his house. Distracted, Hintoyoshi runs to return the item but doesn't see the truck speeding across the road. In a flash of instinct, the maid pulls the boy out of the vehicle's path, saving his life. The driver curses the boy for his carelessness and drives off while the girl admits she's never saved anyone's life like that before, and her heart is pounding. A confused Hitoyoshi hands her the bell, and they say their goodbyes, each going their separate ways. Or at least that was the plan. The boy suddenly changes his mind, saying he was actually looking for a maid and that she can work in his house after all. Without delay, she returns to the Yokoya residence and lays out an assortment of blades on the living room table, explaining that knives were likely the first tools used by humans and, though simple, can take a person's life when wielded correctly. Hintoyoshi interrupts the free lesson, explaining that he needs help with cleaning, not with that. The maid, thinking this is some kind of code for killing someone, asks who needs to be cleaned up. He points to the bags of trash in the room, hoping that's self-explanatory, but she interprets it as someone being inside one of those bags. Exasperated, Hitoyoshi makes it clear that he needs a real maid, someone to sweep and mop the floors. With that, the maid asks if she'll be hired if she does that job. Once that's settled, however, it becomes clear that she has absolutely zero skill when it comes to using a bucket and mop, an utter disaster. At the very least, she manages to recover her balance when she slips in the water she spilled, but not before the bucket she threw into the air lands squarely on her head. Faced with this catastrophe, she wonders how she could possibly be hired after such poor work. Hitoyo, she removes the bucket from her head and takes the blame for asking her to do something she wasn't used to. Considering that, he offers to help her clean the house together. By late afternoon, the cleaning is a complete success, with everything in its rightful place. After hearing the young man's thanks, the maid seems awkward, as if she's not used to receiving that kind of appreciation. Hitoyoshi realizes it's getting late and that neither of them has had lunch having been so focused on cleaning. He asks if the maid knows how to cook, but she responds with silence, so he reassures her that he's got the perfect meal for today and suggests she take a bath while she waits. In the bathtub, she finds herself thinking about the young man thanking her for her work. Meanwhile, in the living room, Hintoyoshi reflects that he should be enjoying his summer vacation with his parents away, but instead he's ended up with an assassin maid who can't clean or cook. But that's not the only thing on his mind. 
If she decides to come out of the bathroom wrapped in just a towel, he has no idea how he's going to handle that, so he mentally prepares himself for the possibility. But before he can gather his thoughts, the woman walks out of the bathroom fully dressed, shattering the guy's illusion. She then sets herself to chopping cabbage for dinner because if there's one thing she knows how to do, it's chop. Without delay, she tosses the vegetable in the air and shreds it into thousands of pieces, finishing the task without breaking a sweat. With that done, all that was left was to make some instant miso soup and serve it alongside the tonkatsu. Hearing this, the woman remarks that she's not quite sure what these dishes are, but doesn't matter much to her. After all, her whole life, she had only eaten to sustain herself, never caring about taste or appearance. Moved by this sad situation, Hitoyoshi assured her she'd be surprised by the tonkatsu because it was made by the Katsuya couple, who have been preparing the best food in the region for over 60 years, all at a very reasonable price. There were even rumors that famous people would disguise themselves just to buy from them. Despite the convincing pitch, the maid remained visibly unmoved, showing little excitement, which left him feeling a bit frustrated. But since that's how things were, he decided to show her firsthand what he was talking about. After splitting the tonkatsu between the two, he placed cabbage on their plates and served one to Ms. Maid, as he liked to call her. Taking advantage of the moment, he asked for her name, but she responded that she didn't have one since she'd only ever been called whatever her employers decided. So the boy could call her whatever he wanted. Not being great with names, Hitoyoshi decided to keep calling her Maid. She reflected that she had never cared about what others called her before, but now something felt different. Regardless, the moment to eat finally came, and Hitoyoshi eagerly waited for her to try the food and give some feedback. When she took a bite, the maid mused that, as always, nothing had changed, she couldn't tell whether the taste was good or bad. However, recalling a vague memory, she commented that the food was warm and pleasant. Inside, she reflected that the bath and the food were warm, just like the person standing before her. Hitoyoshi mentioned that the room where she'd be staying was at the end of the hallway on the second floor, and that the bed linings had been properly laid out, but if something wasn't right, she should just let him know. The woman was surprised to see that the boy had prepared the room for her, and it carried her back to an old memory where she stood holding a mashi. A man in the background said she had passed the test, adding that her skin was as white as snow and her heart as cold as it. On that day, this man had told her what her name was, but now she preferred to say she had none, far better than being called cold woman. Hitoyoshi interrupted her reflection to pass the tonkatsu sauce, saying it just wasn't the same without it. Without hesitation, she poured it over her food and took a bite. The sensation was so delightful that even she couldn't contain her emotion and had to express her joy. Later, at 3 a.m. the next day, Hitoyoshi woke up drenched in sweat after a dream he hadn't had in ages. Hit by a sudden midnight hunger, he decided to look for some instant ramen, but as he descended the stairs, he heard a strange noise coming from the kitchen. Startled, he remembered the maid had said she was a professional killer. Still, he mustered the courage to check what was happening. Peeking into the kitchen, he saw the maid with a red stain on her face. At first, he thought it was blood, but when she turned around, he realized she was actually covered in tonkatsu sauce. Caught in the act, the woman apologized profusely, but relieved that it was nothing serious, the house owner didn't scold her. The maid explained that she thought if she were to die tomorrow, she at least liked to taste that flavor one more time. Not wanting to limit her experience to just the tonkatsu, Hitoyoshi whipped up an improvised fondue with the sauce, since there wasn't much else to make it more fancy. Still, all the maid wanted was to eat everything with the sauce she had come to love, and that's exactly what she did. After the meal, she asked if Hikoyoshi had a nightmare, as she heard him moaning in his room. Fearing he might be a killer too, she had taken the liberty of entering his room and found him calling for his mother repeatedly. The maid had also had a dream where she was talking to the tonkatsu sauce. The sauce said it was endless, and no matter how much she licked, it would never run out. However, when she started eating, she woke up. At least her dream had been different this time since she usually dreamt of bad things. That's why she felt sorry for the boy having such a troubling nightmare. She knew all too well what that was like. Hitoyoshi shrugged it off, saying it was just a dream he had from time to time. In his mind, he replayed images from his childhood where he kept calling for his mother as she walked away. He explained that he could only sleep when lying in his mother's lap on nights when he had those nightmares. Hearing this, the maid found a way to comfort him and offered him her lap to rest on. Her mind wandered back to the man who always said she was born to kill, and that thought enveloped her soul in darkness. But when Hitoyoshi laid his head on her lap, the world around her became lighter. Both felt awkward with the situation, but neither of them backed out, they saw it through to the end. Reflecting on the changes in her life since she arrived at this house, the maid felt her body warming up and found it hard to breathe. It was as if her body was about to burst from the rapid flow of her blood. 
It had been a long time since she had felt this way, reminiscent of the excitement she felt when facing multiple enemies at once. But now the context was completely different. Her body moved without her command and she couldn't understand why this had happened. Deep down, that was all she wanted to know. The next day, while tidying up the house, she was cutting a cardboard box into pieces to make more room in the trash bag. Hitoyoshi noticed her technique and was impressed by the girl's efficiency. Later, he discovered that someone had left a strange animal at the entrance of his house with the words, Please adopt me, written on the box. There was also a letter, which the maid read to the master. I bought him at the pet shop thinking he was a Pomeranian, but he turns out to be a breed that grows very large. He doesn't fit in my house, so I decided to leave him with a wealthy family. Please take good care of him. Hitoyoshi complained about the selfishness of the person who had the nerve to do such a thing, but did not disregard the little animal. He decided to adopt it, as he knew no one else who could take it in, and abandoning it on the street would surely be its death. Regarding this, the maid took on a somber tone and responded that if determined to survive, this animal would endure, no matter who or what crossed its path. This was the so-called animal instinct. In other words, saving a life out of pity might be a recipe for disaster. And if this being was abandoned, it was because it had to be. A life that is unimportant to anyone. If not forced to be strong on its own, such weak beings are destined to die by the roadside. If Hitoyoshi decides to save this life without proper consideration, the consequences of that choice will haunt the animal later to collect for it. After this grim speech, she questioned whether Hitoyoshi was ready to take on this responsibility. The boy wasn't sure how to respond, but when the maid had saved his life the day before, he didn't think it was out of pity. When we see a life in distress before us, it is the human instinct that makes our bodies move before we think. Of that, Hitoyoshi was certain. Hearing these words, the girl became pensive, having never heard of something called human instinct before. Hitoyoshi added that he understands how those left behind feel, but this is his way of acting. With that aside, he thought it best to quickly take out the trash and go back inside. Upon entering, Hitoyoshi quickly bonded with the little creature and offered for the maid to hold it, but she seemed uncomfortable with the idea and declined. Hitoyoshi noticed she became distant after their earlier conversation. So he placed the animal nearby to see if it would cheer her up, but she chose to distance herself again. Hitoyoshi wondered if she was afraid of dogs. Then she awkwardly confessed that she was just a little, but if it was an order, she could touch the animal. The master wanted to know where this fear came from, and the maid shared that as a child, the person she considered her mentor had conducted training where she was left on a mountain filled with wild, fierce dogs. Hitoyoshi was sure that must have been traumatic, so he imagined it would be difficult to care for this animal given the woman's fear. This made the maid feel useless, so the young man hurried to explain that it wasn't that. He just didn't want to leave the little creature alone again. Maybe it would be good for the girl to learn to tolerate it a bit. After all, even if he found someone for the animal to stay with, he didn't want to see the creature pass from hand to hand. Thus, the maid gathered the courage and asked to hold the little one. Then, with great difficulty and trembling with fear, she faced her trauma and held the chubby, adorable puppy. Hitoyoshi noticed that the little one was calm but wanted to know what part of him scared her the most. To this, she revealed that it was his fierce claws, wild fangs, and furious eyes. Honestly, Hibayashi could only see a mochi when he looked at the dog, that sweet made from rice. Amidst this, the animal bit the maid's finger as if it were its mother's teeth, causing the woman to suddenly panic, though she managed to hold herself enough not to throw the little fellow into the air. After this grim challenge, the maid sat on the floor as if her life had narrowly escaped disaster. She apologized for disappointing the master, although Hitoyoshi was quite confused by the maiden's exaggerated stance. After all, he figured the puppy's teeth were just coming in. Nothing more than that. That said, he'd like to take a trip to the vet to check on the health of the new family member. Upon arriving, he asked the maid to stop by the store next door and pick up some essentials like a chew bone, a food bowl, food, and a leash. By late afternoon, they were returning home and Hitoyoshi thanked the maid for her help. In turn, she praised the kindness of the master for in her life to date, she had never met someone like this boy. In the place where she had lived before, failure was not an option. Therefore, each time the boy was kind, she felt a great distance from him. Until then, she had simply done everything that was demanded, but the things the boy asked for were completely different from what she was used to. For that reason, she continued to feel unnecessary to the boy, as if the things she did now were simply insufficient. But of course, this did not mean that she had not felt unnecessary before, quite the opposite. In the world where she lived, everyone fought for the few places one could belong, much like in the game of musical chairs. Age and gender mattered little, as long as you had the necessary skills to get the job done. The problem was that everything she knew how to do seemed useless, making her feel even more out of place. 
Perhaps had she encountered that little dog the way Hitoyoshi did, with love, or if she had realized earlier that the world could be a warm place, she might have become what Hitoyoshi wished for her. That said, she needed to know if she could really stay at her new employer's house, since he might find her unnecessary in this unfamiliar world. Then still puzzled, Hitoyoshi was about to reply when the dog tubbed on the leash, dragging the boy to a corner. Only then did he turn to the lady and assume that all she wanted was to leave her old job and be a normal girl. She asked if this meant she should stop killing, and he replied that's what he understood from their entire conversation. With this, the maid entered an internal conflict, having never known a life outside of that, especially since, as people said, if she wanted to be useful, she had to practice these acts. Violence had always been the only path, but now it seemed another alternative was being laid out before her, exemplified when Hituyoshi invited the woman to watch the sunset. Doing so, she reflected that if she could find a place where she belonged without having to kill people, she might understand more about life according to what Hituyoshi described as warm and cozy. At that moment, Inviyoshi confessed that he was scared when the maid arrived at his house but soon saw that he shouldn't be, as being by her side, he realized the situation was quite different. Deep down, he thought she was a good girl. Hearing these words, the maid kept repeating the term, good girl, as if it were something from another world. At the same time, she was transported back to a very old memory, receiving affection in her early childhood. Thinking about this, she wondered what she should do to become a normal girl and Hituyoshi confessed that this was a very difficult question, noting that the lady worried too much about making mistakes all the time. Thus, a way to start being normal was to understand that making mistakes is part of life. In the evening when she returned home, the maid chopped the cabbage in the most efficient and organized way possible, so she didn't have to focus mentally. Thus, she thought being normal was being efficient. Suddenly, the little dog came to nuzzle her leg. Then the girl, in panic, drew a knife on the poor thing who practically died on the spot, but the truth was that he was just hungry. When she realized this, the woman put out some dog food and resolved the situation. Having done so, she came to understand the animal's feelings and considered this to be normal. After that, she even tried to pet the dog, but Hitoyoshi arrived and left her feeling embarrassed. Hitoyoshi thanked her for feeding the new friend, and thinking he resembled a sweet rice cake, decided to name him Ejima Kataro. The maid liked the name for being easy to understand and for having something sinister about that animal. The homeowner laughed at this conclusion and thanked the girl for cutting the cabbage, adding that she was becoming adept at being a maid. With that compliment, the girl was over the moon. More confident, she asked to take care of Ejima Kitaro, as even though the owner saw him as a cute and harmless little creature, she still viewed him as a wild and fierce dog, which would be part of her training to become someone normal. After all, she wanted to believe in the boy's words. Thus, Hidriyoshi made it clear, with all his words, that he believed in the maid, and these words ran through her mind as if they were the fuel necessary for a profound life transformation. So she promised that she would take care of everything necessary. She then petted the dog, picked him up, and wondered if this is what a mochi was, to which the boy explained with some concern that it was just a comparison, nothing more. Speaking of comparisons, the maid noted that Ejima Kataro was small and warm, which reminded her of when Hituyoshi said he was scared of her, but, after briefly living with her, discovered that the maid was a good girl. Thinking about this, she now felt silly for having been scared of such a little thing. Later, when the meal was ready, she ate the okonomiyaki and was delighted, especially with the katsuda sauce she loved. Therefore, she even asked for more food, and Hitoyoshi replied that wanting more of something we like is normal. Moreover, if the maid had any other wishes, she just had to ask. Regarding this, she wished that Hitoyoshi would give her a name. Unsure what to say, the boy looked for clues to a meaningful name, so he asked when her birthday was. The woman wasn't sure but remembered she was born during a historic snowstorm. Therefore, Hitoyoshi thought of Yuki, which means snow. Hearing this, the maid recalled how her former mentor had named her Stu, because it also meant snow. However, Hidriyoshi gave a new meaning of snow to the girl, saying it was beautiful, white, and warm because when snow falls on crops in winter, its warmth protects the sprouts, which emerge when spring arrives. At that moment, the girl wondered why she moved on her own to save Hitoyoshi, and why she suddenly felt in such a warm world. Maybe it was because this boy made her heart beat so strongly, and if she stayed around, maybe one day she would discover the reason for all this. Thus, she thanked Hitoyoshi for being such a wonderful person and accepted being called Yuki. The next day, Hitoyoshi's younger sister Riko arrived at the boy's house. Just before this, Yuki was playing with Ejimo Kataru in the backyard when her boss called her over. He held back a bit, clearly embarrassed, making her wait to reveal his true reason for calling her. Finally, he showed her an ear-piercing device, explaining he'd really been wanting to get his ears pierced ever since a friend of his did it. The problem was he couldn't work up the courage to do it alone. So he hoped Yuki would help since she already wore earrings and must have experience with that sort of thing. 
So Yuki accepted the challenge and prepared to pierce the young man's ear. But in truth, she was sweating nervously, terrified she'd mess it up. She hesitated, then asked if this was some kind of initiation punishment for new employees. Thinking she might have done something wrong, she apologized, saying she just couldn't bring herself to do something as awful as putting a hole in Lord Hitoyoshi's body. Surprised, Hitoyoshi figured her job was exactly about putting holes in others, so he hadn't expected this task to be an issue. At that moment, Rico rang the doorbell, waiting eagerly to be greeted, having heard her brother had gotten a new puppy. Without delay, Yuki opened the door and without even checking to see it wasn't her brother, she asked Hitoyoshi to show her the little dog only to realize it was a woman standing there. Yuki then asked if the young lady was Lord Hitoyoshi's younger sister, leaving Rico momentarily speechless at the unexpected question. Soon Rico was invited in and became fascinated by how clean the living room was, immediately adoring the cute dog, but she was most captivated by the beauty of her brother's new maid. Irritated that her brother hadn't mentioned this earlier, she nearly pinched his cheeks off in revenge for keeping her in the dark, despite their regular messaging. Hitoyoshi explained he was worried their mother would find out and get anxious. Speaking of family matters, Rico asked what he told their father about all this and he said he'd only requested to hire a new cleaner, nothing more. As usual, their father had agreed over the phone. Regarding this, Rico wasn't sure if their father trusted her brother or simply didn't have time to get involved in his life, but quickly dismissed that thought, remembering it wasn't the main issue here. As she was saying, Rico wasn't pleased at all about being left out of her brother's life updates. Intrigued, Yuki asked if the two lived in separate houses and Rico confirmed, though her awe at the maid's beauty soon made her turn her face away in embarrassment. Hitoyoshi explained that his sister loved beautiful people, and that was exactly why he hadn't told her about Yuki. With that, Rico went back to squishing her brother in annoyance, accusing him of trying to monopolize the maid. Shortly afterward, the little sister took the chance to introduce herself properly as Hitoyoshi's younger sibling. Likewise, Yuki introduced herself, explaining that Lord Hitoyoshi had given her this name, which truly surprised his sister, as she hadn't thought her brother capable of such a thoughtful gesture. However, Rico paused, contemplating when the maid mentioned receiving a name from Hitoyoshi, prompting Yuki to explain she had been an assassin, and since she didn't have a specific name, she had asked the young man to give her one. Though Hitoyoshi had tried to prevent her from saying this, he was too late, and now his little sister knew the whole bombshell and began trembling. But it wasn't fear, it was excitement from hearing such a wonderful story. She even wanted an autograph from the strong, beautiful woman. So she pulled a notebook from her bag and asked the maid to sign her name. As Yuki did so, Riko observed her in admiration, thinking she looked like a painting in that chair. She then whispered to her brother that Yuki resembled a lady more than an assassin. With that, Yuki finished signing her name on the notebook, but something about the signature puzzled Riko and Hitoyoshi. Riko commented that her handwriting was strange, so Yuki explained she could speak around 12 languages from her travels for work, but had never learned calligraphy, apologizing if her signature looked messy. However, Riko responded it looked like a cute idol signature. Next, the little sister announced she had a fantastic idea. Her vacation project theme would be Yuki. But for this to happen, Yuki would need to show off her deadly skills. Hintoyoshi made it clear that his sister couldn't write anything bizarre, so she promised it would just be an observation diary about the new assassin maid, lovely to the point of death and her special abilities. Hearing this, Hitoyoshi was at a loss, burying his face in his hands while Yuki invited the little sister to follow her out to the garden. Once there, Yuki first placed an apple on Riko's head, did a backflip, and threw a dagger right into the fruit with pinpoint precision. Riko was thrilled by the display and jotted down her observations, curious about where Yuki had pulled the knife from. Yuki explained she had a pocket near her chest and kept 16 knives in her uniform, though she reduced it to five after Lord Hitoyoshi said it was too much. One stayed in her chest pocket while the rest were in her garter. Noticing Yuki lifting her skirt to explain this, Hitoyoshi requested she make things less illustrative. As they headed back indoors, Riko admired the little bell in Yuki's hair but thought it might interfere with her work. Yuki explained that when her Tari heard the bell, the fatal strike had already been delivered. The little girl thought this was the coolest thing ever and made note of it in her journal as her stomach growled. Hitoyoshi burst out laughing at his sister's hunger pangs, and she defended herself saying it was just simple hunger. Speaking of which, the young man asked if she wanted something to eat. Given it was lunchtime, Riko then asked what Yuki could cook. The maid herself wasn't sure if what she made would qualify as a dish, but since they insisted, she went off the kitchen. After some time, Yuki was chopping cabbage in her usual way and explained to the little girl that this was the most efficient and uniform technique for doing so. To illustrate her point, the maid placed a plate of chopped cabbage on the table, leaving the little one awestruck once again with the impeccable cut. 
However, man does not live by cabbage alone, which is why the Yokoya siblings took the maid to a fast food chain to enjoy a hamburger and fries. Hitoyoshi mentioned that the cabbage would be saved for dinner, while Riko noticed a poster announcing today as the day of the summer festival. Hitoyoshi drew Yuki's attention to show her that at the event there was a senbei stall with the sauce she loved, which made the maid slightly drool with anticipation. For this reason, she was eager to attend the festival, and Hitoyoshi was excited to take them both. In the late afternoon, they arrived at the event, and Riko's eyes sparkled with the beauty and fun of the place. Without delay, she pulled the two to the shooting game, but missed her first shot. Now it was Yuki's turn, who positioned her gun methodically and intimidatingly, but also missed and admitted that shooting wasn't her fort. Later, at the goldfish scooping game, Yuki played with great efficiency and taught Riko that the secret was to erase her presence and quickly attack the target from behind. The stall owner commented that the little girl had a very kind big sister, and Riko confirmed that it was wonderful, causing a reaction in Yuki's head. Later, the trio went to a stall with the beloved katsuda sauce, and the maid was moved to tears by the chance to devour such delicious food. Motivated by the woman's happy expression while eating, the stall owner excitedly made another senbite with sauce on the house. Meanwhile, Riko ran off the to drink, and since she couldn't call her sister back, Hitoyoshi was afraid to leave the spot and risk losing sight of her, so he decided to sit and wait for her return. To pass the time, Hitoyoshi made small talk with his maid, asking if she had ever been to a festival. Upon hearing this question, Yuki remembered that she had indeed stepped into one, but not exactly to celebrate, rather to carry out her duties. At that moment, fireworks exploded in the sky, entertaining the two until Riko returned with the drink. Then the three sat together to enjoy the scene. On the way back home, after buying more senbei to take with them, Riko read in her notebook that Yuki had already eaten eight, so it might be a good idea to stop for today. Hitoyoshi then wondered who the older sister was now. Suddenly, a motorcyclist sped by after stealing a purse and nearly hit Riko, but Yuki saved her just in time. Hitoyoshi checked if the girl was hurt, but she was enchanted because it was the first time someone other than her father had carried her like a little princess. Having said that, the boy turned to pick up the things that had fallen and declared that evil people like that motorcyclist should receive divine punishment, not only for stealing but almost killing his sister. Hearing this, Yuki leaped between the buildings to deliver the punishment the boy mentioned, and Riko urged them to follow the woman as soon as possible to include the maid's punishment of the crook in her diary. With that decided, they chased after Yuki and saw her throw her knives at the motorcycle's wheel, causing the thief to fall immediately and be at the mercy of the maid. Just as she was about to pursue the man with more knives in hand, Hitoyoshi called out to her, but she didn't respond. He desperately pleaded with the maid not to kill the man, yet Yuki simply tapped lightly on the visor of his helmet and stated that was her divine punishment. Having done that, she confessed to Mr. Hitoyoshi that she was hungry, so they returned to the festival to buy more senbai. Later, on the way back home, Riko celebrated that her research project was the best ever written. Yuki asked if everyone had to do such projects, leading the girl to deduce that the maid had never been to school by asking such a question. In turn, Yuki not only had never been to school but didn't even know what it meant. Then the child explained that it was a wonderful place where you study, meet friends, and participate in clubs. At that moment, Riko received a message from her mother announcing that there would be stew for dinner, and she ran ahead to hurry back to her mother's house later. Meanwhile, Yuki commented to Hitoyoshi that it had been a lot of fun being with her and that many things she did today seemed to be normal people stuff, as the boy had said. If that was the case, Yuki would also like to go to school. Since she brought it up, Hitoyoshi wondered how old she was while remarking that she really should go if she wanted to. Days later, when he realized it, Hitoyoshi noticed that August had ended, marking the start of a new semester. At school, he worried about Yuki being alone at home. That and a friend of his shared a rumor about a beautiful maid seen in the city. This made Hitoyoshi spit out the milk he was drinking, imagining that these outings with Yuki might sooner or later make the woman a topic of public conversation. Regardless, he pretended not to know what the guy was talking about. Another friend mentioned seeing her in the library, leaving Hitoyoshi puzzled with this information, but at least happy that no one knew Yuki was his maid. That said, the teacher arrived in the classroom and introduced the new transfer student, Yuki Yokoya. 